Hello everyone, I'm Chris Potts. Welcome to part three in our series of screencasts on presuppositions. In the previous screencast, we defined what presuppositions are and explored the concept of accommodation. And then we identified some tests for presuppositions using discourse behavior and also projection behavior in complex sentences. So those are really the fundamentals of presupposition. And now we can turn to some case studies that seek to use these concepts to better understand particular linguistic phenomena. To start, let's look at perhaps the best studied presupposition trigger, the definite article. We've already seen some evidence that it's a presupposition trigger. I think our negation interrogative and conditional antecedent tests will all point to that designation. And indeed, this is clearly the analysis that Partee has in mind in our reading from the start of the course. Partee's analysis is given in 32 here. And it says, the meaning of the N uh, is the individual A such that A is the one and only member of the meaning of N, if the meaning of n has one and only one member, undefined otherwise. The presuppositional analysis is reflected in that closing undefined otherwise. The idea is that if the incoming noun n doesn't have exactly one entity in its denotation, then the whole definite description collapses. In technical terms, this is a partial function in that it's defined for inputs that are singleton sets and undefined for all others. In 33, I've tried to bring this out a little bit more by writing it as a little computer program. So in this program, a set argument comes in, and the first thing we do is check that the set has exactly one member. If it doesn't, we raise an error, a presupposition failure. If the presupposition check passes, though, then we return a member of x, but only in that case. Since there's only one member of x, if we reach this stage, then we don't have to specify which member any of them will do, again, because there are no choices. So I think this is a reasonable start, and we can compare it with Keenan's proposal. What Keenan proposes is essentially that the singleton requirement is just part of the truth conditions. So he gives it as a quantificational determiner because that's what Keenan always does. But the heart of it is this conjunction. X has cardinality 1, and X is a subset of Y. Now, this is going to give results that just seem wrong when we negate it. Consider the dog isn't happy. If there are lots of dogs, then the dog is happy is false, and so the dog isn't happy will be true. Uh, but that seems pretty clearly wrong, so I'm inclined towards Partee's presuppositional theory. However, I think both these theories have a lot of trouble explaining our own experimental data. Recall that early in the quarter, we did an experiment in which you rated the naturalness of specific continuations in two-sentence mini-narratives. And in 35, we have a summary of those results. The top two pairs are the crucial test items. So for example, the first says, Sam brought his bicycle to the campus bicycle shop. The front wheel was misaligned. And this gets high ratings. But in this situation of a bike shop, there are many front wheels. Thus for Keenan, the front wheel was misaligned is almost certainly false. And for Partee, it's undefined. Compare that with the second item. Sam was browsing around the campus bicycle shop. The front wheel was misaligned. This gets low ratings that might be more consistent with the Partee analysis, and maybe the Keenan one if false sentences are apt to get low ratings. Um, the pair of examples with the purple bar shows the same sort of pattern. The first is, at the coffee shop, Joan looked around for a place to sit. The table was a bit tippy. And this gets low ratings, which might be predicted by Partee and Keenan. But both of them clearly predict low ratings for the next variant, too. At the coffee shop, Joan was reading near the back. The table was a bit tippy, but this got high ratings. The rest of the items are fillers, but some of them make the same kind of point. For example, Greg bought a dozen eggs. The egg was broken. This looks like a presupposition failure because the meaning of egg isn't a singleton in this context, clearly. But then what about Hank closed the window? The bee was buzzing outside. There might be a lot of bees in Hank's area, but this sentence still got high ratings. So what should we do? In response, I propose a minor modification to Partee's theory, and I've given that in 36. It really differs from hers only in introducing a notion of salience. I haven't given a theory of salience, and it might, in fact, be hard to give such a theory, but I think that's fine. Uh, it isn't solely up to linguists to figure out what notion of salience is involved here. Sorting that out would likely be an interdisciplinary project that involved linguists and vision researchers, perception researchers, attention researchers, and maybe others. And that alone is striking to me that 
interpreting a definite description encompasses so much of our cognitive lives. There's one more thing I want to do with this theory of the definite, and that's that I want to show you that our presuppositional treatment easily derives hypothesis N in the context of our full, full compositional grammar. So to see this, we first add two simple rules to our grammar from before. Rule D is the vital one. It tells us how to interpret definite noun phrases. And here we just apply the meaning of the to the meaning of its NP complement to create a DP. And then rule TVD just slightly expands rule TV to allow for definite descriptions as direct objects. And with that in place, we can derive simple sentences like Bart never teases the parent. And here you should zoom in on the direct object, the parent. When we applied the to parent, that triggered our presupposition check. In this case, since parent denotes a singleton containing just Homer, everything works out. We get Homer as the denotation and we can proceed up the tree as though nothing special happened. The presupposition appears to be projecting through the negation, but that's only because it was just a local check inside the direct object. Compare that with exactly the same sentence, but now with the child in the direct object position. Recall that in our model, there are three children. What happens now? When we apply the to child, the presupposition check fails and we end up with no denotation. And from there, everything falls apart. The direct object has no meaning, and so T's doesn't get its argument. And so the VP doesn't work. And then never comes in it, it doesn't get what it needs. And the result is a sentence, really, in the end, with no meaning. We have a total collapse. So this is why you've got to accommodate. My second case study continues themes from the first. This is presuppositional quantifiers. Recall that in assignment four, question one, we, you were asked to identify differences between neither and none. And for the meaning-related differences that people identified, I think we can now trace them to the presuppositions of neither. So to start, in 39, I've defined a presuppositional treatment for neither. The first clause is the define a discondition. It says the meaning of neither applied to a set is defined if and only if the set has cardinality 2. Where defined, the meaning of neither is that it asserts that its two arguments have an empty intersection. So this is literally the meaning of no, and so we're just directly saying that neither is no, but with this presupposition of two-ness for its first argument. Once again, we see that Keenan wants to turn everything into regular semantic content, no presuppositions. His version is just like 39, except that it packs the defined in this condition 39a in as a conjunction with the regular content. So this means that neither student studied is false if there are more than two students, for example. And that just seems strange. And it gets stranger when you consider that it's false that neither student studied will then become true solely because there are more than two students. For assignment four, of course, you hadn't heard about presuppositions, but I still think that many of the responses converge to the same presupposition insight. For example, many people said things like, with neither, we assume it's about two people, or in the neither case, it's assumed that the speaker is talking about only two. I think assume here is a non-technical reflection of the presupposition idea. I found this next case really clever. The response began with two examples. Example A, Grace and John felt awkward around their colleagues. Neither of them had seen last night's football game, so there was nothing to talk about. And then a minimal pair with B, Grace and John felt awkward around their colleagues. None of them had seen last night's football game, so there was nothing to talk about. And the observation is really elegant. Both sentences are well formed. However, sentence A implies that Grace and John hadn't seen the football game and the rest of the staff had. Sentence B, on the other hand, implies that the entire staff, including Grace and John, had missed the football game. So, in other words, neither pushes us to interpret the anaphore them as the group of two, whereas none pushes us to interpret them as the larger group. And I think this pressure actually is rooted in the presupposition of neither. Here's a similar observation. Many speakers might feel misled if someone said none of my friends came to the party when they were in fact referring to only two friends. This is all, I think, trending toward a pragmatic principle that says one should use the presuppositional item if one can, otherwise avoid it, and all of that might relate to deeply Gricean pressures. Finally, I think these nice examples begin to show that the presupposition is pretty hardwired. 
these students marked neither of the five options is enticing and of the four choices neither seemed wise as ungrammatical, perhaps reflecting the inherent contradiction between the demands of the full sentence and the presupposition of neither. Very cool stuff. Great, let me sneak in one more case study here. Uh, this one is less worked out and perhaps less conclusive than the others, but I find the data to be fascinating. Our focus is on the verb know, as in knowledge. And the question is, does this verb have a factive presupposition for its complement clause? Our initial test suggests that it does. For example, Sam didn't know it was Wednesday seems to presuppose that the speaker believes it's Wednesday. And you can compare that with the believe version, which clearly does not have such a presupposition. Similarly, we can use hypothesis Q. Does Sam know it's Wednesday? Again, it looks like the speaker is presupposing it's Wednesday and just asking about Sam's knowledge. Finally, if Sam knows it's Wednesday, he'll show up. That's a use of hypothesis C, and it seems like we're conditionalizing only Sam's knowledge, not the presupposition that it's Wednesday. But then we get to a complex real-world case like 49. This is from the book The Bush Dyslexicon by Mark Crispin Miller. You can tell from the title that Miller has a low opinion of Bush. And the quotation begins with a remark from Bush, Bush saying, That woman who knew I had dyslexia, I never interviewed her. I confess that this did at first sound like an accidental admission of dyslexia because he says, knew I had dyslexia. And Miller seems to want to interpret it that way as well. He writes, overlooked in all the merriment was the statement's inadvertent confirmation of the Sheely thesis. That woman who knew I had dyslexia makes clear that the reporter got it right, otherwise Bush would have used said or claimed. Spoken like a true semanticist. But is that a good analysis? My hunch is that it isn't. What we have here is a kind of mocking derision of the reporter from Bush. And I think that using no in this non-literal way makes it even more mocking. So that might actually be leveraging the presuppositions, but not in the way that Miller was describing. I think the next example here is similar. This is from an article called Confessions of a Non-Serial Killer with subheading Conspiracy theories are all fun and games until you become the subject of one. So the author of the article was the target of a conspiracy theory. And this sentence here is a description of the conspiracy theorist's mental state. It says, But I guess when you know something terribly important that the entire world thinks is hooey, it gets harder and harder to let it go. Is the author here accidentally revealing that the conspiracy theory is true via an accidental use of no? I strongly suspect not. Rather, with this utterance, we're inside the minds of the conspiracy theorists, and no is serving to convey their very strong commitment, commitment so strong that it can be presupposed, perhaps. And I think Bush is doing something similarly perspective shifting in example 49. The next two examples are somewhat different. So in the first we have, for the first time in history, the US has gone to war with an Arab and Muslim nation and we know a peaceful solution was in reach. Now, unfortunately for context, this is the first US war in Iraq, not the second. But anyway, can the authors here actually know at the time of writing that a peaceful solution was in reach? I don't think anyone can know such counterfactuals. Similarly, in 52, we have Hillary Clinton. Again, for context, this is in connection with the campaign against Obama, not Trump. So she says, let me tell you something. When it comes to finishing the fight, Rocky and I have a lot in common. I never quit. I never give up. And I know that we're going to make it together. So here she means, I know that I will win the election. She did not. So this is a kind of quality violation to be sure, since she didn't have the evidence needed to presuppose this content. But what's really happening in these cases? I would go so far as to say that the speakers are acting as if they can presuppose the content in question. In acting this way, they convey very strong commitment. It's as though they can take for granted that it's true and that everyone accepts that it's true. And such linguistic moves can have a really strong social signal behind them. It's very dangerous, of course, since they're toying with the maximum of quality here, but it might be an effective rhetorical strategy and one that works precisely because no harbors a key presupposition. A final data point here. Uh, in the book, Speaking of Crime, Solon and Tiersma have a wonderful chapter on false confessions, and they find that linguistic strategies play a role in leading people to make such confessions. And I believe presuppositions in general are a major part of that. 
If the interrogator continually produces utterances that presuppose false things, the suspect is very likely to begin accommodating them just as a way of making sense of what the interrogator is saying. And if this accommodation happens in the right circumstances over a long period of time, the distinction between what one believes and what one has accommodated as part of this sense-making process is likely to become very blurry indeed. And in this snippet, you can see again that no may be a powerful device in this regard. The interrogator uses no again and again to invoke presuppositions and to re-invoke them and strengthen them and so forth. And the suspect is resisting and also using I don't know as a phrase to do that. But you can see how this might wear a person down and lead them into a set of beliefs that are quite different from reality. And indeed, stepping back, departures from reality are a theme running through all of my attested examples with no here. I think we're seeing that presuppositional content can shift reality in some subtle and hard to spot ways that can have serious real world consequences. And that's a nice transition point into the next screencast, which is going to focus on the role of presuppositions in political framing.